All right, guys, today we're going to cover chapter six, which is lifting and moving our patients. We're going to go over the body mechanics that are needed for safe lifting, and some guidelines that are needed, um, how we lift and move them, how we package a patient, as well as some general guidelines for as far as carrying um, a patient using either a backboard or a stretcher. Every call that we go on requires some type of lifting and moving of the patient, as well as lifting and moving our equipment. So you want to make sure that you lift and move everything properly because otherwise it can lead to not only yourself, but the patient to become injured as well. So there are some measures that we can take to help reduce that risk of injury, and that's what we're going to go over today. Um, there are four basic body mechanics that you can use to take advantage of, um, of to allow your body to gain a mechanical advantage to help minimize uh, the potential for injury. The first one would be keeping the weight of the object as close to your body as possible. Okay, this helps reduce uh, the amount, <coughs> excuse me, of strain that will be placed onto your back. It keeps the weight on your legs. That's where you want most of the weight to be at, is your le legs, hip, and gluteal muscles. Those are the biggest and strongest muscles in your body. Um, that's the next one. Make sure you use those muscles when you lift. Don't use your back. Your back is full. It has tiny, tiny strands of muscles. They are not designed to lift the type of weight that we are using to pick up these patients. Use your legs. They're that big for a reason. Stack your shoulders over your hips and feet. So that way you have a good uh, center of gravity. And then once you're ready, once you have your shoulders stacked and you're ready, move everything up as a unit. If any of the three are not aligned with the others, you start causing a twisting force that could potentially cause harm to your lower back. And then finally, is try to reduce the height or distance through which the object must be moved. Get closer to the object. Reposition it before lifting. Bring it closer to you if you are able to. Because if you just try, if you reach something out with your arm stretched out, you don't have as much control as you would with it at your, with it pulled into your core. So if you apply these principles of body mechanics to when you're lifting, carrying, moving, reaching, pushing, or pulling, it helps, it prevents injury by maintaining a correct alignment of your spine. Maintaining this normal inward curve in your lower back reduces the potential for spinal injury because it reduces the amount of strain placed on it. Keeping your wrists and your knees in normal alignment can also prevent injury to your extremities. And also, when possible, if you're able to use equipment to move your objects instead of manual force, it's even better. Such as putting all of your gear on a stretcher when you're going into a home. Having an a automatic stretcher that lifts everything can lift everything up and down for you. All of this could potentially help. So when you have poor posture and, fit and fitness, this can cause fatigue and uh, to your back as well as your abdominal muscles. This ultimately causes an increase to your risk of injury. So you want to be aware of what your posture is. One of these extremes of poor posture is called sway back or excessive lordosis. In this posture, the stomach is too anterior to the body and the buttocks are too posterior causing excessive stress on the lumbar region or the lower back of your back. Another extreme is called the slouch or uh, in severe forms the humpback syndrome also known as kyphosis. In this posture the shoulders are rolled into a forward position which ultimately results in fatigue to your lower back and once again increases pressure on every single region of your spine. Because as you can see in this one with let me get my, my pet laser pointer up, you have a forward 
exaggerated forward curvature of the of the spine. So every all of this strain is being placed on these vertebrae here. In kyphosis, the it causes your um, center of gravity to be pushed forward, and now it's putting strain not only here but it is placing strain on the lower spine as well. A proper standing position <coughs> is your standing is, um, straight. Your knees are slightly bent because if you lock your knees you can cause yourself to pass out. Your pelvis is slightly tucked forward. Your ears, shoulders, and hips are in a vertical alignment. This places you into a position where everything is properly aligned and you have ultimately reduced your chance of having a lower back injury to a minimum state. When you're sitting, your ears, shoulders, and hips should still be the same, should be in a vertical alignment. Pelvis slightly tucked forward. You shouldn't be slouched and sitting in the chair. If you're sitting properly, your weight is evenly distributed to both of your ischias or both of your pelvic uh, hip bones. Your feet are flat on the floor or even crossed at the ankles and it keeps those your lower legs in uh, a normal state. By maintaining good, even if you have good body mechanics, it cannot compensate for poor physical fitness. If you are physically fit, you are, it means that you are in a proactive and well-balanced life that should include flexibility training, cardiovascular conditioning, strength training, and nutrition. By doing this, it helps prevent injury, enhance your physical performance, and as well as manage the stress that you do within your life. Now, am I saying that you have to be completely physically fit? You should be going to the gym every single day and uh, look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. No. Look at me, for example, A. I'm not the strongest person in the world. I'm pretty sure at least half of you, half of this class, is probably stronger than me. But I have the strength to be able to maintain, to do my job, to lift what I need to. I have the flexibility to where I can lift with either my arms stretched. I can stretch my arms out, I can twist, I can turn with whatever I need to do. I have cardiovascular conditioning. I'm able to, I may not be able to run a New York Marathon. I probably won't even be able to run a mile. Part, not because I can, it's just because I don't want to. I did enough of that when I was in the military. But I'm able to, if I'm having to do chest compressions, if I'm having to uh, go back and forth to the truck, whatever I'm needing to do, I have the capability to do that without causing myself to have a heart attack. I'm also, I even eat a nutritious meal. I don't eat candy all the time. I don't go to McDonald's and get a a large Big Mac every day. I try to eat stuff that is healthy for me. I eat apples. I eat, well, let me backtrack. I eat fruits. I eat vegetables. I eat uh, my protein. I watch my carbs, calories, okay? I watch what I put into my body. My body is my temple. I am happy with where I'm at right now. Uh... When communicating, just like we discussed in the previous chapter, communication is key. And when lifting anything, everybody should be properly trained on how to do it. Uh, because your patients can come in all sizes, shapes, strengths, such as a football coach uh, positions players according to their abilities. We should rec uh, uh, place rescuers in a way that we can capitalize on their abilities to ensure the best outcome in an emergency. So if I'm lifting a stretcher, should I have someone who's five foot two working with someone who's six foot six? 
Probably not. Probably wouldn't be turn out very well. Now, in the event that that happens, if they work together, they can compensate for it. But they need to be aware of it. When communi when you're beginning to lift a patient, communicate among each other. Y'all will understand this when we can start practicing with the stretchers. Also, tell let the patient know what you're doing. Hey, we're going to lift on three. One, two, three. Lift the stretcher up. Okay? Let them know what you're doing. Uh, make sure you use good teamwork. This starts with sizing the scene up immediately as you arrive on scene. You need to make sure that you communicate throughout all the lifting and moving tasks. Use commands that are easy for everybody to understand. Make sure that you coordinate verbally each lift that you're doing from beginning all the way to the end. Now, mind you, once you get work with someone long enough, some of this you might be able to do without speaking if it's just you and that person. But when you put more people in, you may not be able to do that. Just as important as communicating between team members is communicating with the patient. If you startle or frighten that patient and they shift their body weight while you attempt to lift them, this can cause you to drop the patient and now you cause injury to the patient. Not only that, when you go to lift that stretcher, you're lifting based off the patient's position at that time. So if they go and shift, it may put more weight and strain on one side of your body and now it causes uh, disabling could potentially cause disabling injury to rescuers as well. So if they're able to understand, tell them, hey, we're going to lift you up, don't move, lay real still, and we'll get you in. Alright? Make sure you know your abilities and your limitations. Don't ever try to lift something that's, that's more than what you can handle. <coughs> don't overestimate yourself or other rescuers. Just because someone looks like they're able to lift something doesn't mean that they can. Before lifting anything, try to determine the weight of the patient as well as the weight limitations of the equipment being used. Some stretchers you'll around this area can only handle, can, not some, all stretchers can only handle so much weight. Some can handle 500 pounds, some can weigh 600, 700. There's even stretchers out there that can handle up to 2,000 pounds. Know the limitations of your equipment. If you need extra help because the patient's too heavy, call for it. Call for help so that way, because if you get hurt, if you get injured, you're not going to do anything. You're going to put take yourself out of the game, and you're not going to be able to help your patient. Also, always try to make sure ensure that you have an even number of rescuers to maintain balance. So, if you have a two-man lift, one at the head, one at the foot. Four-man, two at the head, two at the foot. Or two on either side. Try to keep it even. <coughs> When lifting a patient, the power lift technique is the one that's most commonly used. It offers you the best defense against injury. It also ensure it protects the patient with a safe and stable move. Because when you're lifting the patient this way versus palm down, you have more control. You have more strength as far as your grip. When you're doing this, you want to make sure that you keep your back locked. Do not bend at the waist. Lift with your legs. Squat down to the patient. Get your power grip. Lift the patient up. With the squat lift, this is an alternate alternative technique. If you happen to have a weak leg or a weak ankle, um, when you're doing this, um, still same thing. You want to make sure that you keep your back straight. <clears throat> what you would do is place um, one uh, one foot behind you and then lift up with your leg muscles. Okay, It helps take some of the strain off that bad, bad leg. 
<coughs> if you're having to carry something one-handed, uh, same thing. Make sure that you maintain proper body mechanics. Keep your back straight. Uh, try to avoid leaning to the opposite side to compensate for the imbalance. So if you're carrying something in your left hand, don't lift, lean to your right. Otherwise, you're going to cause the injury to your lower back. If you're having to reach for something, generally a person can sustain 100% effort for approximately 6 seconds and a 50% effort for only 1 minute before becoming fatigued when they are reaching. After that time, the potential for injury greatly increases. So to minimize effort whenever possible, reposition the object to a point to where now you're having to avoid or reduce the amount of reaching and lifting you're having to do. Especially in situations in which prolonged strenuous effort is required. So do not try, if you're having to reach for something, no more than arm length, don't lean into it. If you're having to do that, try to move around to get to the object. Occasionally you may come into a situation where you're having to push or pull an object, such as moving a patient from one bed to the other. When possible, pushing rather than pulling is preferred. If an object has to be pulled, try to keep the load between your shoulders and your hips and try to keep it as close to your body as you can. Keep your back straight, slightly bend your knees, so this will help keep your line of pull through the center of your body and try to and keep you centered. And then in a smooth thump move, pull the patient towards you. Emergency moves, these are moves that we do when there's an immediate danger to either the patient or to the rescuer. <coughs> Such as a uh, possible uh, an explosion that's about to occur, um, something is burning, and we need to get the patient out very quickly. We'll do this through one of three ways. We'll either do an armpit forearm drag, the shirt drag, or the blanket drag. With the armpit forearm drag, it's just what it sounds. You'll place your arms underneath the patient's armpits and grab them by either by the, the opposite wrist, so that we have control of them, and drag them towards you and out the door. Shirt drag, you'll grab their shirt and uh, just grab them by the shoulders and drag them out that way. With the blanket drag, you will place them, uh, wrap them up in a blanket or a strong sheet like a cocoon and pull them out. Now, when you're doing this, you are not taking spinal injuries into consideration, so be aware of that. You have to have a legitimate reason to do this, definitely if a patient that has a potential spinal injury. Urgent moves, we use these when there's an immediate threat to life and the patient has to be moved quickly and transported for care. Indications may include altered mental status, um, respiratory failure, uh, fractures of two or more long bones, um, the patient appears to have shock, or you may have to get to a patient, uh, to move to the other patient in the vehicle, and this one's getting in the way because they're more critical. So we may have to do an urgent move. And we'll do this through one of two ways. We'll either do rapid extrication or self-extrication. Self-extrication is when the patient gets out of the vehicle on their own. They op We've removed the car door and the patient's able to get out on their own. Rapid extrication is when we're actually getting them out. So we may quickly put a C collar on to them to maintain, to maintain spinal mobilization and then urgent and then quickly get them out. A non-urgent move is one in which no immediate threat to life exists and the patient can be moved in a normal manner when ready to transport. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's no threat to, to neck. Uh, no obvious injuries, their vitals are stable, but we need to move them from one point to the other. Once again, we'll do this through one of four different ways. We'll either do a direct ground lift, um, an extremity lift, a direct carry method, or a 
the draw the draw sheet method. With the ground lift, what's going this is not recommended for a heavy patient. This would probably be better for a smaller patient, maybe a child. Um, if you're going to consider doing this, it would probably be best to use your backboard. However, if this is not accomplished, this is how you're going to do it. You're going to take two or three rescuers that will line up on the same side of the patient. Um, each rescuer would bend nail down to, on one knee. Um, and basically everybody would cradle underneath the, the patient. And then while they roll, they would roll the patient in towards their chests, lift them up, move the patient to wherever they're needing to go. With the extremity lift, <coughs> excuse me, what they, what you will do is you may have, this can be done with a three person carry um, or it can be done with a two person where you would do partial, uh, or you would do it on the armpit, uh, armpit lift. So you would take underneath the arms, grab their wrists, and then you have another person that grabs their legs. You lift them up that way, carry them to the stretcher. Uh, direct carry method: you just come up, patients laying in the bed, you come up to them, lift them up, roll them up to you, move them to the stretcher, almost like the direct ground lift. Only now they're they're up onto a bed. Uh, draw the sheet method. Um, you can either take the sheet from the bed that they're currently on, or roll up, get a sheet underneath of them, load them up, move them to the stretcher. Packaging for transport. This is when we're readying the patient for transport. Um, whether it's on a stretcher, uh, backboard, whatever, we want to make sure that the patient's stabilized in the proper carrying device, and then we move the patient to the ambulance. We always want to make sure that we use devices that package the patients for transport properly, pad where needed, um, cover the patient with um, sheets or blankets as needed. If you have the capability, you can use stair chairs to carry patients not only up or down stairs, but in narrow spaces and elevators that you may not be able to get your stretcher in. Um, when going up or down stairs, you want to try to use a spotter to help guide you up or down so that way you don't trip or fall. And make sure you not only are communicating with your patient but your partner when lifting and moving the patient on the stretcher. Your equipment that you will use, you'll have a wheeled stretcher. These stretchers can carry up to 650 pounds depending on their uh, certificate or their what they're certified at. Um, you want to try to use them on smooth terrain. They don't have very good hydraulics, so you're going. The patient's going to feel every bump that you go across. Uh, make sure that you fasten all the straps to secure the patient in. They're on there for a reason. And never leave a patient unattended. Definitely, if you have the stretcher at the highest setting, because then it is very easy for that pit, that stretcher to topple over. There should always be at least one person with that stretcher. But if there's only one person with a stretcher, it better not be moving. When going up or down stairs, when using a two-person technique, you should have one person here, one person at the top. And when going downstairs, you go down feet first. And when going upstairs, you just go, you're going head first. Okay? You always want the feet facing down. That way, in case you drop the patient and he goes tumbling down, he doesn't hit his head when he reaches the bottom. All right? With the four-person stretcher carry, all four wheels are off the ground. Each rescuer is on a corner of the stretcher, so that way they're able to handle the weight properly, and it is completely balanced, and they're able to carry the patient out that way. With the wheeled stretcher, the roll-in type, this is the one that's most commonly used now. Uh, these usually can weigh anywhere from 70 to 100 pounds. Um, it has four wheels on it, so that way it can be moved in any which direction. They do have brakes on them, so you want to make sure that the brakes are not applied when you're using them. 
Um, it also has special wheels at the head to assist with loading and unloading the patient from the back of the truck. So it helps out a lot compared to what we used to have where we have to, would have to lift the stretcher wherever we would go. You may also have bariatric stretchers. These stretchers are designed to hold up to 1,600 pounds. The reason we've had to go to this is because of our population it is continuing to ever grow as far as becoming more and more overweight. So due to this, our stretchers and our ambulances have had to be um, designed to accommodate to where we can transport these patients. And these stretchers and devices are called bariatric devices. Some of these devices, as I say, can hold up to 1,600 pounds when the wheels are down. They ha usually come with larger wheels for stability as well as wider dimensions. So that's why you need to have a truck that is designed for them. Some of these transport ambulances that, uh, carry, that are known to carry these bariatric stretchers, they are usually have some type of winch or ambulance ramp that is designed to assist the crew to get the stretcher into the back of the truck. You may also have a portable stretcher. These uh, usually come in three different models that you have, where they may fold or break away. Uh, they may even have wheels and posts on them. They are great because they're able, you're able to use these to help carry patients that are, might be in a confined space, or even if you're on a call that involves more than one patient, and you don't have, you know, obviously you don't have more than one stretcher in the back of the, your ambulance. This is one of those portable stretchers. This one has metal posts for stability, as well as wheels at the base to help move the patient around. <coughs> These are light, so they're easy to be moved around. But with lightness and with this type of design comes weight restrictions. It can only usually these are only have a load capacity of about 350 pounds. Although even if you have a patient up that ha you should never try to put a patient upwards that 350. You shouldn't put um, even though it's ready to handle it because it's still a lot of strain on the rescuer. With this type of stretcher, this is the one that you'll commonly see in in military usage. Um, there are still some services that still use these. This would be your canvas litter. The, um, the great thing with these is they can be folded up um, into a confined space and are easily to carry and they're very lightweight. Same thing with the pre with the with this stretcher. These are usually only have about a 350 pound limit. Um, so be careful though even then getting up to that weight because it can cause it to break. We may also have stair chairs. Uh, these are useful when we're having to go up or down stairs or go through some narrow spaces because um, you're able to strap the patient into it. And with a lot of the stretch stair chairs that we have now, when you're going downstairs, um, they have tracks on them. So it will it actually will assist you in the process of going down the stairs and take some of the weight off you. So that way it's a lot easier going down. Now, if you have a patient that you suspect to have any kind of spinal or lower extremity injury or even altered mental status to where they're unable to follow your commands, you don't want to put them on here due to the risk of causing, uh, causing worsening of their condition. Backboards, these are used when we're having to use patients or having to transport patients with suspected spinal injuries. These can also protect a patient from rocky ground surfaces. If we're having to move them, uh, let's say they're out in a field with a lot of rocks and we may have to put them up or down to allow the rescuers to take a break, this will have, allow that, them to take, or allow to protection to the patient. Um, with these, there, you may also have what's called a short spinal board. Um, these will be used for like your pediatric patients. Uh, you can even have a vest type immobilizer device. Um, such as a KED, we would use these to get uh, patients out of a vehicle. And then you can also have a full body vacuum mattress where it goes completely around them and we vacuum the air out of it and it conforms to around the patient. These are great because it even reduces the chance of um, sores 
to form up on your patient. With the long backboard, there's generally also a CID and a C collar that has to be attached as well as straps to help strap the patient in to secure them with these boards. This would be the vest type um, immobilization device or the KED. Um, we usually will put the, tuck these in behind the patient, we'll strap them into it, and then it allows us to move them out. And once we get them moved out, we'll then put them onto a long backboard and then transport them to the hospital. This is the vacuum mattress. So we place them, um, log roll underneath them. We'll take, make sure that we maintain spinal precautions. Um, place this underneath the patient, strap them in, and then vacuum the air out, and it secures the pa around the patient. The scoop stretcher. Um, this is great because we're able to use them in confined areas where other stretchers may not be able to fit. It's also great for pelvic fractures or bilateral femur fractures. So that way we're not having to uh, cause further injury by moving the patient. However, uh, these generally come are usually are metal, so they get can become very hot as they conform to the temperature of your environment. Um, but, and they are also not recommended for patients with suspected spinal injury because it can, the patient may have to twist to ensure that there's no, they don't get pinched because there are pinch points on this. This is the scoop stretcher. With the basket stretcher, or also, also known as the scoop, uh, excuse me, the Stokes basket, um, if you've ever watched any videos or movies uh, with the Coast Guard when they lower the basket down, this is what they're using. These will generally carry most scoop stretchers as well as backboards. They can also be placed on a wheel stretcher as needed. Um, when using these, you want to make sure that you have a, a rescuer, um, at least two, more preferred. Um, so that way you can carry this properly. It's also great when you're having to move a patient across rough terrain because of the way that it rolls up. It protects the patient as well if you're having to go over any, uh, lift the patient over any type of rough terrain. You may also have flexible stretchers or reef stretchers. These are great to use in um, confined spaces because, once again, it's just like using a sheet. There's not really much rigidity to it, but you're able to get it underneath them and lift them up and move them out. Um, it does allow for rapid spinal motion restriction in tight spaces, but not enough to uh, fully protect the patient. So you still want to get them onto a backboard as soon as possible. When positioning your patient, uh, most commonly patients are placed either supine or sitting position on the stretchers. Um, however, we want to take into consideration the patient's condition, such as what's their position of comfort. Are they more comfortable sitting up or are they more comfortable laying down? Um, if we lay them down, are they able, still able to breathe? We may need to roll them on their left side. Uh, if they are pregnant, you definitely want to place them on their left side because it takes the weight off of their inferior vena cava and ensures that they don't become too hypotensive. <coughs> if you have an infant or toddler, you want to take into consideration because you may have to use some other means to properly secure them in the, in the truck. Um, you may have to use the car seat, the one that they were in. Um, with elderly patients, uh, you don't may not want to lay them flat because they may have some type of medical condition where they can't breathe, or they may have kyphosis and they're unable to lay flat. You may also have patients with physical di disabilities, so you always want to be aware of what's going on with your patient and treat them accordingly. When preparing to package a patient for air transport, you want to, if needed, you want to decontaminate the patient because the last thing you want to do is to load a patient that's contaminated with some type of substance 
throw them into a confined area, and now not only could it be potentially cause further um, contamination, but depending on what it is, it can cause an explosion. If there's any kind of airway management needed, you want to go ahead and manage it. Um, can let the patient know what's going on. Make sure that um, any wounds and the eyes and ears of the patient are covered. Make sure all of your equipment are secure before the helicopter arrives. And ultimately, listen to the flight crew. If they tell you to do something, listen to them. Don't approach it before, don't approach the helicopter without them knowing. Uh, when carrying patients, it's best to use a wheeled stretcher. If, you're, if they're unresponsive, make sure that you secure the patient's hands. That way they're not flopping all over the place. Make sure that you keep their weight close to your body. Make sure that you are aware of your limitations. When carrying with, with a two-person carry, make sure that one person is at the head and one is at the feet. You always want to keep the side of the stronger person at the head because that's where most of the weight is going to be at. All rescuers should be facing each other. The one at the foot should be walking backwards when lifting the patient. If there is a third person, use them as a spotter. When going with a four-person carry, one rescuer should be at the head, one rescuer at the foot facing away from the rescuer at the head. Now this is when moving. And a rescue on either side of the patient facing forward. This is to help ensure that the pa that you don't wobble. Also, when patient when you only are able to live with a two person, you when moving definitely going over rough terrain. You want the person that's pull that's at the feet to be facing the patient as well, so that way they can have both hands on the stretcher and it ensures that they don't topple. Uh, when carrying a patient a supine patient on stairs. A stair chair is preferred, but it's not always feasible if your service doesn't have it. Um, make sure that your patient is secured to the vise. If available, make sure that you use a spotter. Make, remember, go down patient feet first. All right. If you're able to and the uh, stairs are wide enough, get more people on, there, on that stretcher to help carry it down. We may also have to deal with neonatal isolates. These are used for transporting newborn patients. Um, usually these will these are very heavy and it requires very intensive care. Um, usually these will uh, secure to the stretcher mounts on the ambulance. So just load them onto the stretcher, secure it on, and then transport and then you'll be able to transport. Make sure that you know how to properly secure it before loading it. Alright guys, that's it for this chapter. Uh, if y'all have any questions, make sure you either write them down or send them to me in Blackboard. Um, if not, if otherwise, I will see y'all in class. Y'all have a good one.